Good morning. <laughs> morning. So uh, congratulations on uh, winning uh, Amersham and Chesham. That's quite something. We're absolutely over the moon, as you can imagine. Yeah, that's I, amazing. I and my, my colleagues, a lot of activists from Twickenham and Richmond and yes. activists up and down the country have been piling in in the last few weeks. And um, uh, yeah, I think we've really tapped into something, a lot of uh, disillusionment and people feeling neglected and let down and not listened to by the government and being taken for granted. So it's, uh, it's a pretty epic win. And uh, I think it it's really continues a trend we saw at the local elections in some of these sort of very Tory areas in the Shire. Yes, the shifting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely so, delighted and feeling quite tired. I was there. Not much sleep. <laughs> well, I was there a lot of yesterday. I went to bed for, for an hour or two, and then my husband, who was struggling to sleep, who's also very active in the party and a, and a campaigner profession, professionally, woke me up and he's like, well, yeah, check your phone. It looks oh, like we've won. And then, then I was up for about an hour and a half in the middle of the night and then went back to bed. So, yeah, feeling a bit jaded today. And, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining us, um, you know, on, on such a, an important day for you all. I, I'm really pleased for you all that you did so well. That's fantastic. It makes all the hard work worthwhile. Um, but as yeah. you know, we are independent, so we're sorry for the others. Yeah. But uh, hey, um, now moving on, um, I just wondered, it would be quite interesting um for us all to hear how your first term has been going what the experiences have been any highlights anything that you feel you'd like to share well i mean obviously it's been an incredible first 18 months as an mp uh i didn't bargain on there being a global pandemic no. when i got elected <laughs> um so it's Absolutely. been uh it's been a baptism of fire. I mean, obviously, as a new MP, I expected it to be uh, utterly overwhelming at first, but clearly add to that a global pandemic. And it was uh, indescribable, I think, if you, uh, when I think back to the thousands upon thousands of emails I've been, I was getting every week in the, in the mm -hmm. certainly in the first, uh, well, I'd say probably the first, six to nine months of the pandemic uh, so yeah. at a local level at constituency level uh clearly lots of people concerned and anxious and yes. uh, that's overwhelming casework in that sense but also uh at a national level i mean i was appointed the liberal democrats health and social care spokesperson last january yes. again yes. before we knew there was a pandemic and then suddenly i found myself having to respond to what Me was do. effectively a national emergency uh, challenging Matt Hancock week in week out in the House of Commons but also talking to the media about what was going on but I mean you know, it, it was an honour anyway to be elected in December 2019 but also you know I, I think a particularly privileged position at this difficult time when people are looking to uh, their political representatives to be you know uh, challenging the government on decisions that are being taken and holding them uh, to account um, yeah. But it's been, yeah, uh, uh, nonetheless, I have, um, I'm really grateful to have been given this opportunity by uh, the residents of Twickenham and Teddington, Witten, St Margaret's and the Hamptons. Um, yes. And, you know, apart from COVID, which obviously has dominated the first 18 months, I have worked on an awful lot of other issues as well, uh, special educational needs and disabilities, right. but also uh, children's mental health, air pollution, but lots, lots of issues also related to the pandemic. So, for example, uh, those three million people who were excluded from support, many of whom I know are your members. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, in the Chambers of Commerce. So I've been doing lots of work on a whole range of issues as well. And they're grateful. Yeah. <laughs> So it's been it's been an incredibly busy 18 months, pandemic dominated, but also doing lots of other things. But also, I, I think for me, the biggest frustration as a new MP has been not being able to get out and about in my community and my constituency as much as I would have liked because of the lockdowns. You know, that the, the school visits programme has only really got going in the last month or so, visiting businesses, charities, and other organisations across the constituency has been really, really difficult. Um, but I have been able to get out to, to one or two, you know, I went to visit Touchlight. Yes, uh, they said. Uh, recently yeah. And, you know, just 
inspirational, amazing, such an important local business, but also a strategically important business for, for us nationally and, in fact, globally yes. as, as world leaders in what they do and the yeah. work they are doing to contribute to uh, the pandemic efforts, but also tackling cancer and, and other rare diseases. Yes. It's yeah. all, all inspiring to see that right here seems... in Hampton on the banks of the River Thames. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, changing the world, literally. Uh, impressive yeah. stuff. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much um, for, for that. And I, um, as spokesperson on the, I mean, I'm thinking nationally as well as across London and locally, um, your spokesperson role, uh, kind of what are the memorable points on that? Apart from the fact you were holding, and you were, I mean, we saw yeah. that holding the government to account. That was very clear and, and extremely uh, well done as well. But what, what else? So, um... Well, I guess on the in terms of the pandemic, I, you know, it's a memorable moment for the wrong reasons, because for me, one of the biggest tragedies and, and scandals of the pandemic has been what unfolded in our care homes across the country. And, you know, obviously locally care homes were affected as well. Um, but I remember vividly last March before we went into the first lockdown, when I say last March, I mean March last year, not this year. Um, yeah, you know, I there were several times when I stood up in the House of Commons and I raised with Matt Hancock testing uh, for uh, staff in care homes, PPE for staff in care homes and discharge of patients from hospitals into care homes without testing, um, to which I didn't really get much of an answer. It was very clear to me then that because understandably uh, it, there was a huge yeah. priority and focus on the NHS, mm -hmm. it, unfortunately that there wasn't a uh, priority on, on care homes and, and the protective ring that has emerged, uh, emerged far, far too late. And so uh, I guess in terms of, the memorable moments for me in the pandemic it's it's, it's not necessarily a positive one but but one that, that sticks with me um back yeah. then and and as a local level i guess from the pandemic where i've also been able to using my spokesperson role nationally challenge matt hancock was when i was getting lots of stories here in twickenham back in september time when the school, kids went back to school yeah. lots and lots of people despite having the test center here at twickenham stadium not being able to access tests and being told uh, you you know you can travel halfway across the country to get a test or then being told to game the system by putting in an Aberdeen postcode to be able to access the test in Twickenham which I then raised with Matt Hancock it made the national newspapers and yes. finally they changed the loophole that, that stopped that happening um, but so that so that was you know with a, with a local uh, angle I mean for me personally one of the big issues that I wanted to champion when I became health spokesperson was children and the young people's mental health and obviously that's been impacted even more through the pandemic so I've continued to to, to raise that uh, right the way through and you know, I, I've already touched on the issue of the excluded which is another big issue I've championed I led a debate on it actually in December oh, uh, yes. in the House of Commons Very challenging, challenging the, uh, ministers directly on the lack of support and and that continues and we know there are and I know we're going to touch on this shortly but there are clearly sectors that still can't reopen or certainly not reopen fully and many of those who are excluded from support freelancers self-employed and so on are in those sectors and still without any single penny of support no okay thank you very much for that that's extremely um extremely uh, comprehensive and uh yeah and it's it's just also quite sad to see the impact on people um i mean i actually only gave my christmas presents to my sister's family only uh, three weeks ago you know it's unbelievable isn't it i haven't seen so uh, you know everyone's a bit others have much more heart-rending stories than that I mean, i'm not um terrible times it's been yeah i mean people not being able to see families i think the other uh, group of people who are often overlooked who are, i've actually had a number of meetings with uh people affected over the pandemic have been carers unpaid carers yeah. so if you're looking after somebody who's elderly and frail or who's got dementia or a, a child or working age adult with with uh disabilities it's been yeah. incredibly difficult both financially mentally 
physically it's really taken their toll and and I and and my party leader Ed Davey neighboring MP in Kingston Surbiton have made it we've made it a real uh, issue to champion and prioritize because they're so often forgotten yet they save the exchequer and the economy so much money through the work that they do it's one of the reasons why actually the, the, the local link here is home link here in in Witten near where I live yeah. um, provides respite care and they were desperate to reopen sort of last uh autumn early autumn late summer um and they needed access to to testing and they were struggling to get it at the time mm. um, to be able to reopen i'm delighted that they are able to they're open now and able to provide that respite care um and and support to carers because they are really the unsung heroes battling the system day in day out and often totally overlooked and not recognized mm. thank you for that um, and mental illness, I mean, it is quite high amongst the youth. Is that right in the press? That's, right. That's right. So we know that uh, according to NHS digital figures in 2017, we knew that about one in nine children um, and, or young person had a diagnosable mental health condition that's that's leapt to about one in six at the height wow. of the pandemic um, and you know that's that's a wide range from those uh, dealing with say, anxiety as a result of uh, you know, both the pandemic related issues but but wider than that because frankly there was a crisis in children's mental health before the pandemic yes. um, but also so, you know, right through to, to very serious conditions where, you know, children, young people are attempting to take their own lives. And it's, it's just horrifying. And one of the reasons I made this uh, an issue that was my priority um, before the pandemic was I was really shocked as soon as I got elected in December 2019, every single week. I was getting emails or surgery mm. meetings with parents of children and teenagers okay. struggling with their mental health. And I knew this was an issue that needed tackling and the social isolation and the uncertainty over exams, the lack of uh, proper university experience, the, the impact now on jobs and the employment outlook for young yeah. people, all, mm -hmm. all of that I think has served to, to exacerbate um, you know, their mental well-being and, mm. and, and mental ill health. And is there any uh, likelihood that the uh, that Richmond uh, residents can, uh, in respect to mental illness, can attract more funding or is that? Well, so, I mean, when you challenge the government, they have to, to give them credit where credit's due. They have ploughed more money into this area. The problem that, uh, when I say this area, I mean this area nationally. overall in England, nationally, yeah. um, mental, children's mental health. The problem we have in tracking what gets through to a local level is actually the data and the reporting is, is, is not very clear and it's quite opaque and it's something else it's a technical and dry point but it's not one that I have actually been doggedly pursuing oh, with, minister, with ministers and and had individual meetings and uh, with them to try and uh, improve the data and reporting at, at a local level I think we are underserved in terms of the yeah. money going in compared to the numbers that we have here it is something I will continue to push for better uh, local funding. Of course, we also have some wonderful charities working in this space locally, like Off the Record. There's yeah. a, another newer charity that works with younger children, like the Purple Elephant Project, which oh. you may or may not have heard of in Twickenham, um, that, that, that does children's uh, therapy, art and play therapy with those oh. children who are, uh, and, family, and their families who are struggling. And of course, Richmond Council through their voluntary fund has been uh, over the past year raising more money from uh, council taxpayers who wish to, to pay a little bit more than their council tax bill uh, right. towards uh, you know on a discretionary basis into a fund which was specifically in its first year aimed at off the record and Richmond mind because of the, the, the high uh, prevalence of mental health issues particularly among our young people. And I hear from uh, people in that sector that because we're um, seen to be a prosperous borough, that that's a problem for getting uh, the monies into the the trust. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the problem in, in lots of public services. I mean, this is why when people complain as well that our council tax is so high in Richmond, I mean, largely what happens is we're seen as an affluent borough. We get much yeah. less central funding in terms of 
other local council services, but also whether that's in terms of our school funding and uh, health funding, etc. The, the, the flip side of that is actually one of the reasons why actually we have a higher than average across London uh, number of um, young people engaging in what they term risky behaviours. Some of that can be attributed to the fact that we are quite an affluent area. There is uh, either you know overtly or you know just subliminally almost a, a real pressure on children and young people to yeah. perform well academically truly and achieve True. high etc and a lot of that pressure as well as all the issues that we know through social media um, and the, you know, the rise of all the different uh, online platforms and, and the impact that's having on young people I think is really uh, impacting and, and drugs <laughs> yeah of course yeah and, and that's part of the risky behavior side of things that um, I'm touching on but um, I, and also uh, you know on, on a slightly more positive note I think the fact that people are much more willing to recognize and talk about mental health conditions and present that's themselves true. I think is also driving the increasing numbers yeah, thank you. Just making notes. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do a, a very small introduction, if you don't mind, if you could bear with me, just to say um, a little bit about the Chamber of Commerce for people who don't know about it. We're an independent, non-political, non-profit, represents, sports, supports, promotes more than 5,000 businesses. Um, and there are up to 17,000, but we believe over 5,000 operate across the borough. And that's startups, contractors to corporates um, operating in the borough. And uh, just to, to make you aware, Manira, uh, um, I'm now on the on the South London leadership team, or on the London leadership team for the London Chamber of Commerce, and the South London um, partnership as well. And within that group, South London partnership, <laughs> I lead the employer representative group on um, the Skills Accelerator currently, and doing that with local. Uh, colleges in Kingston, but also in uh, Twickenham and Croydon and uh, Merton and across the borough, across that region. So that is just for people who don't know about us, I, and also to update you a little on um, what we've been getting up to in in the period since we spoke last. So um, just to frame things. So I just wondered um, the what you what your view was on businesses dependent on less social distancing and we know what they are the hospitality events travel theaters who are hit again by monday's announcement what is what is your position um, on that because it is a big um it's a blow to these businesses you know that you've probably heard from them um, yeah. is a blow we're hearing a lot i mean i like many people um, and many business owners up yeah. and down the country just obviously absolutely gutted that uh, that we've had to have this delay um, especially because I think it was avoidable um, I don't uh, it was very clear to me when Professor Chris Whissey pre presented his slides on Monday at the press conference it was clear that we were right on trajectory to meet the the June um, 21st uh, deadline to come out of restrictions and as soon as the Delta variant hit our shores yeah. it took off um, and you know that that was a political decision not to put uh, India on the red list sooner which allowed the, the that variant to seed into our community and take off in the way it has so I am um, I'm devastated for all those businesses uh, in the in the hospitality tourism events weddings uh, travel okay. sector all of them I mean you know you know them and your, yeah. your members know them and I, I'm sure I've left out many uh, sectors from that list um, unfortunately given where we find ourselves I think regrettably it was the right decision to delay because I think the last thing anybody wants to do is for us to end up going backwards and having more restrictions put in place because case numbers go through the roof and suddenly we see more hospitalizations because it is largely affecting uh, younger people who we know are less likely to get it severely but nonetheless some, a number are ending up in hospital and many are ending up with long covid yeah. um, but that one of the reasons and this is really That's important the reason why i and my liberal democrat colleagues did not vote with the government on wednesday around the extension we withheld our support was precisely because 
these uh, continuing restrictions and that uh, asking the British businesses and British people to make those further sacrifices had yeah. to come hand in hand with additional support, particularly for the sectors affected. Yes. Uh, and I said this very, very clearly in the House of Commons to the Health Minister, um, yeah. as did my, my Treasury colleague, that you've got to have a bespoke package of support for these industries that are continuing to bear the brunt of us not being able to resume you know, life without a uh, many of these restrictions, particularly social distancing. And, and I, I will single out particularly the travel industry because I think right. that the travel industry going forward, it will be even longer before we can return to any level of normality. We know now that the biggest threat, given that we've had such a successful vaccination programme and we got our own case rates so low before the variant hit, the Indian, uh, the Delta variant hit, that our biggest threat is from outside uh, our own shores and therefore continuing to have very robust public health measures at our borders is key but also um, helping to ensure the rest of the world gets vaccinated quickly because yes. not only is it absolutely morally the right thing to do absolutely it's also in our own interest because it's what is going to make us go backwards if we do go back and nobody but nobody wants that so we need much more so, uh, financial support for those businesses uh, affected and also more financial as well as practical support for those people who are asked to self-isolate who can't otherwise afford to do so because that is key to breaking the chains of transmission when people are asked to self self -isolate. that's true because that's what they found up in the north around Bolton and Blackburn wasn't it that they didn't have the resource they felt that was the uh, reasoning yes uh, of, I mean, uh, we know that lots of people who are perhaps on zero hours contracts or less secure jobs who are on minimum yes. wage will avoid taking a test in case yeah. they are. it results in them being asked to self-isolate or if people do take a test and they're asked to self-isolate, they may not adhere to the rules. Financial support is one part of that. And one of the things that I've consistently argued for for many months now is akin to furlough. Somebody who's asked to self-isolate should essentially be paid their wages. Um, and and the, there should be practical support, whether that's accommodation for those in overcrowded housing or support with dependents and supplies um, to be able to self-isolate. Because frankly, it's a lot cheaper than having blanket restrictions. I mean, paying people to self-isolate is far cheaper than doing blanket furlough policies when we have to have restrictions in place. So it makes yes. sense from a public health point of view. It also makes sense from an economic and financial point of view. Um, and I'm really alarmed that the government hasn't uh, done more in this space. And actually, there were reports earlier this week that the Treasury actively um, encouraged, uh, discouraged uh, officials from putting out guidance that actually are, apparently the current furlough scheme does allow you to furlough people who are self-isolating for that period to be able to pay their wages. There was, it's been, um, there were some leaked documents that were reported on earlier this week, um, which I'll be challenging ministers about next week. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you very much indeed. That's very interesting indeed. And it's so true what you say in the long run, it makes more sense. And you can, it's about a pragmatic perspective. Absolutely. And these people, I mean, the downside is they're carrying the virus around with them. So potentially, you know, so it's madness. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I think just, sorry, just going back to the business point, one of the things that we continue to call for is the furlough scheme to be extended because I think we're going to have this cliff edge. So I think we should see furlough extended to the end of the year and at least the business rates uh, holiday for retail, hospitality and leisure um, for the rest of this financial year to help companies balance sheets and, you know, because yeah and looking at maybe small businesses and other sectors uh, to be included, uh, you know, we've got to take a, a pragmatic approach. Yeah, okay, that's really fascinating. Thank you so much, um, extremely comprehensive, thank you. Um, right, well, yes, uh, COVID vaccinations. Uh, yes, the next question, <laughs> they're likely to remain with us now. Um, I just wondered whether you could, consider one um if i could kind of wrap a couple of questions together one the covid vaccinations they're likely to stay with us for a while to come maybe for a number of years so i just wondered what your perspective on what 
on that, what, what it was on that. And secondly, uh, double vaccinated uh, people. I think I know your answer from last time, but um, yeah, um, that's another question as to whether they can travel. I know people in the borough, for example, would very much like to, to travel now they've had two vaccines, many of them. Um, I just wondered what your view was. Well, first of all, can I just start by saying thank you to our fantastic NHS staff and the, the thousands of volunteers uh, you know, locally and yeah, across absolutely. the country who have made the vaccination effort so incredibly successful, as well as the, the many scientists who, who helped discover these wonderful vaccines. I know we've oh, got... Amazing. Uh, Exactly. I mean, I, I know there's there's many people in this area who, who work in uh, both research uh, academically and, and in businesses involved in the life sciences sector. Um, and I'm really grateful to them as well as the NHS. And, and I also know lots of volunteers locally who have been volunteer vaccinators, marshals, etc. Um, and I'm also thankful to our local residents who have taken up the vaccine with such enthusiasm. We've got huge, I mean, actually, the uptake rates across the the country are very very high compared to other yes. countries but particularly yes. in our borough here so so thank you to, to all of them and yes it's it's true that we may need to have booster vaccines going forward depending on what goes on uh, with variants and so on so I think uh, the fact is I think the majority of the population is going to be double vaccinated very soon um, yeah. and therefore uh, I don't think whilst I think we may absolutely it's inevitable that we'll need vaccine passports for international travel we can't control what the sort of policies and laws are in other countries and it, it just it makes sense for the UK to cooperate as part of that uh, okay. kind of uh, arrangement I, I'm yet to be convinced that we need a vaccine passport for domestic purposes I think it adds a lot of a burden uh, and a lot of complexity for businesses who would then have to police it and uh, yeah. the, 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 there's the administration there's the policing of it and putting your you know businesses having to put their staff into uh, almost being bouncers on the front door of their businesses so I, I, I think yeah. we've seen around the world even before we had the vaccine there were many countries that were able to fully reopen including things like sporting events and theatres yes. and restaurants and things uh, without uh, vaccine passports because we didn't have vaccines at that point at the end of the day it comes down to test trace and isolate working very very effectively and I've already touched on where the self-isolation part frankly, is nowhere near good enough. And that's the key yeah. missing element. Okay. Uh, continuing to have robust public health measures at our borders, whilst the main threat continues to be from uh, incoming uh, variants. Um, and and the, the vaccination take up, frankly, with such a high vaccination take up, I don't understand why you would need a COVID ID card to be able to get in anywhere. I think we risk creating a, a two tier uh, system, a confrontational system. It's, it's just it's not it's not how we do things in the UK frankly <laughs> yeah I agree yeah. so and I think most businesses would agree with that they wouldn't want to be in an onerous position of policing as you're absolutely right um, but equally there are care industry I hate to bring it up but uh, there is um that's a really, that's a really tricky tricky yeah, area and I can absolutely understand why uh you know, the government's having to look at that area that particular sector um in terms of making Exception. sure that there's a hundred percent uh take up and clearly if you've got a loved one in a care home you would want to know that the staff are fully vaccinated so but you know, as a liberal for me it sits ill with me to to say for make it mandatory for anybody to have to have some sort of drug or vaccination although they are there are precedents we know that for surgeons I think they need to have I'm assuming it's a hepatitis vaccination there is some sort of jab that surgeons have to have I think for actually the the it two two things it throws up for me um which are in some ways more important than the principle is the practicalities I know the care home industry um, feel there needs to be a lot more work done around the legal aspects of this the insurance aspects of this and having that support from government around that which at the moment none of that has been suggested other than the proposal of mandatory vaccinations um, but also it, even if we were to accept as a society that this is perhaps uh, you know the right An thing exception. to do in this area 
my worry with everything during COVID where we've given government exceptional powers is where's the mission creep and what next? And, you know, we can't allow then government to say, well, then you have to have done X or Y to be able to work in, in a particular industry, you know, unless there are good, you know, very, very strong, clear public health grounds for doing so. But I think the practical side of things are, uh, for the care industry is what I'm hearing from care providers because they themselves are split on whether this is the right thing to do or not and let's not forget there is a recruitment crisis in that industry yes. um, there are huge tens of thousands of vacancies in that industry they're struggling to recruit not helped uh, dare I say it by Brexit um, and, it changed and Covid it's uh, a combination uh, as a combination but the immigration rules now and the the the, the end of yes, treatment has has massively impacted on that sector and this could further exacerbate what is already a, a real um, workforce crisis in that uh, sector so and there needs to be a lot of thought as well around definitions uh, around who is included in this uh, in this rule or not because you've got whole gradations of care workers from you know care home workers to you know, people who work in sheltered accommodation to yes. you know, that all sorts so there needs to be real clarity around that yeah thank you very much and um speaking of shortages uh, just touching on it um a huge shortages in as you as we all know in hospitality construction um agriculture i suppose in many different uh, sectors i just that, that have been caused by both Brexit and Covid. Um, uh, just wondered what your views were on on what strategic measures maybe the government could take to improve the situation at this stage. Well, I mean, picking up from the last question, I mean, the example yes. I cited about the care sector, I mean, that's one yeah. area where I have been calling for and campaigning for there to be uh, more of an exception so how you you know you might, may be aware that as part of the new immigration system uh, yeah. there is now a, a health and care visa but actually that um, left out the vast majority of care workers uh, social care wow. workers in terms of their salary level still doesn't uh, meet the threshold they're still not considered yes, as, yes. you know yeah. highly skilled etc and so we've been pressing for uh work in the care industry to be to well to be included as part of the health and care visa because of the crisis that's in that uh sector and so i see uh, when you start to i mean given the impact on many different sectors whether that's you know the the, the hospitality industry whether that's agriculture uh, whether that's construction yeah you know, there are so many areas where you end up creating exceptions i think it it only proves the point <laughs> that uh the, you know the end of both the end of free movement uh but also the, the new immigration policy frankly doesn't serve our economy well and i absolutely take on point um the take on board the point that we need to be uh investing in training and skilling up uh you know british citizens to be able to take on some of these jobs that takes time and in the meantime there, there are crises in various industries so you know i and my liberal democrat colleagues continue to fight for a fair and effective immigration system that treats everyone with dignity and respect, but also is the right system for our economy um, uh, going forward. And youth unemployment um, uh, is important to touch on that because that's mm. truly heading, uh, it's already a crisis heading for a further, a larger crisis. 20% um, of uh, our young people are unemployed. Yeah. Oh, it's just shocking, isn't it? And it's going to grow. I just wondered if you had any views on youth yeah. unemployment and measures that could be taken to improve that. I mean, if I could just say one word more broadly about course, how young please. people have been impacted by this pandemic. Yeah. I mean, I really think you know, they have been disproportionately impacted and some of the worst hit yes. in terms of just the impact on both their lives on their lives both socially and economically as well as you know we talked extensively earlier on about their mental health and well-being yeah um, they've made 
huge sacrifices to be able to protect the most vulnerable, uh, often been, I think, wrongly singled out as not wanting to necessarily abide by the rules or being vaccine hesitant. Frankly, the bank holiday uh, event at Twickenham Stadium proved everybody wrong when we saw yes. hundreds, of hundreds of young people queuing for their vaccination. I found it moving and so emotional and really inspiring. Mm. And, and therefore, the fact that actually we've seen youth, you know, unemployment hit uh, or youth employment hit the hardest uh, in terms of the pandemic it really uh, it pains me and we need to be doing everything we can as policymakers to address that so uh, I mean one of the things that I and my party have been uh, pushing for is you know a huge um, you know investment in our in our recovery but in our green recovery in particular creating hundreds of thousands of new you know well-paid jobs in in various green industries whether that's energy home insulation green transport nature protection all of this will help create new jobs it needs to come with skills reskilling and training and that that the whole skills agenda is really critical now because we've seen vast numbers of people sadly lose their jobs in yeah. sectors such as aviation we know very well mm -hmm. because to Heathrow frankly I don't think the aviation in industry uh, is going to recover anytime quickly right. you know, if, it, if it does and therefore given that we've got lots of people who need to be reskilled that the skills agenda is absolutely key coming yeah. back to young people the apprenticeships levy yeah. is really important and trying to reform that so that more employers can access funding to to boost apprenticeship numbers and during the the mayoral election um you know, the, uh, the liberal democrat mayoral candidate was talking about having a sort of apprenticeship hub to, to be matching young people with training opportunities and encouraging businesses to create uh, apprenticeships a sort of uk style mm -hmm. london apprenticeships hub um yeah. so um I, I think we need to do much more in, in that space as well um yeah, and as I said, we're leading the way um, with our Chamber colleagues and also with the London Chamber of Commerce on this skills agenda. And we're all extremely ho um, hopeful, really, that we can make a difference this time. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what gives. Um, but we're not because of the levelling. That was something um, I was wanting to ask you about the levelling up. Um, because London feels very left out, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think I think leveling up actually translates to leveling down London. Yes, um, in so many ways, sadly. Yes, it's how we feel, and so we've we've put in our um, our bid uh, to get some get an LSIP going across South London. But you know, we're not that hopeful because uh, London isn't really likely to get any money. So <laughs> no. It's disappointing because there, we do have a problem in London and it needs to be targeted. And also we've got the issue, as you know, between the Labour mayor and the Conservative government. Um, and again, I help. think London as a whole is seen as that affluent bit of the country that doesn't need yes. support. Well, whereas actually some of the highest levels of poverty and deprivation are to be found within London. So, yes, there is great wealth. Um, but there is also huge amounts of poverty. And let's not forget the London economy is a net contributor um, compared to the amount of money that, that, that London uh, attracts from the Exchequer. Actually, we put far, yeah. far more in um, as, as a city in terms of the, the, the wealth that we create and the, the jobs and you know, the, the output that we have as a city. So. Uh, you know, it's really sad whether that's in terms of transport, whether that's in terms in terms of skills. I'm sure you're aware, Anne, that uh, uh, the, there are now plans to cut the London waiting allowance from our from London universities, which is going to impact London universities heavily, oh. including St Mary's here in Twickenham. And I was doing some work uh, trying to raise that earlier this year. And, and Gavin Williamson's letter on it very blatantly and explicitly says this is part of the government's levelling up agenda. So they're the definition yeah. of levelling up was to take money away from London um, and uh, it's not clever and, and actually you know the, the Russell Group universities the Imperials and the UCL will, will manage fine it's universities like St Mary's and Roehampton yes. which are particularly focused on more vocational courses yes. have do tend to take in a much more mixed demographic from widening participation Agreed. backgrounds that are really yeah. going to hurt through this yeah 
And of course, um, London needs investment, you know, World City needs investing in, um, just as uh, as you've seen with TfL and the money's being, um, that TfL being squeezed, yeah. um, is a concern uh, going forward as to the, yeah. the impact on London. And I've just been horrified by how TfL has been used as a political football. Um, Which we, as you know, we didn't want that to happen and yeah. it is happening. Yeah. And now they've been downgraded by Moody's. That could uh, apparently that will impact on the GLA's uh, ability to raise money. It's really concerning. Well, it is, and uh, I, I, as I say, I think this is all part of the levelling down agenda. It was playing politics up to the mayoral campaign. I mean, now the mayoral election is out of the way. I would hope that there could be a bit more of a grown-up conversation around this, but. Um, yeah. Hope springs eternal. And the, the fact that, the, you know, through the pandemic, all the different train franchises got given sort of medium term settlements going so that they could continue to operate going forward, because obviously every single transport system uh, was was struggling because people weren't traveling and therefore you know, money wasn't coming in. But TfL was just being given these short term hand to mouth uh, rescue deals. Um, yeah. And you know, being backed into a corner to to you know potentially cut under 18s free travel, make cuts to Freedom Pass. You know, last time you and I met, we were talking about these threats to expand the congestion charge yeah, and yeah. so on. You know, all of these things were just being imposed by the Department of Transport onto London um, because as part of a political agenda rather than having a, a sensible negotiation to, and, and thinking much more strategically about London because you know we know TfL doesn't just serve Londoners it serves many millions of people who travel in from outside London every single day in normal times yeah and in normal times from overseas as well it's very exactly. much a city that is uh, very very strongly connected to other cities around the world which is going to be the strategy moving forward to build a uh, very very strong links with um, certain cities around the world um, so that's quite exciting. Um, I had a meeting just to mention with Andrew Bailey as well at the Bank of England I, and I just to brief him, I was asked to brief him on uh, Richmond, Richmond boroughs um, economy and uh, so I was pleased to be able to say that largely we, we've been um, in a good, good way, businesses have responded extremely well um, been incredibly resilient, incredibly so, and actually to the point that I think they're exhausted. <laughs> there are those who are pedalling very fast, who, you know, have got new markets and so forth, and others who are just pedalling to keep, just to keep their nose above the waterline. Um, it's a tough, tough time, and I did emphasise that point, um, but uh, on the whole, um, I would say that we've managed to attract new businesses into the borough, um, which is good news, onto our high streets and into various uh, parts. But overall, it's just a comment, really, just to let you know that we'd we'd briefed um, briefed the Bank of England on that. So, and overall, we're hoping that the economy is um, going in the right direction. Um, obviously, there are difficulties that businesses are facing, like, uh, for example, um, you know, the know your business know your customer software that the banks are all updating that's causing some um some of our members not to be able to and businesses across the borough not to to actually see that their uh, bank account is taken away from them it's quite shocking um mm. without but there is recourse but it, it doesn't appear to be recourse uh, it appears to be a punct final you know that's it wow. so uh, quite worrying but uh, overall we're just battling through <laughs> But we, we are resilient in the borough. Uh, yeah. I just wondered from your surgeries, are you hearing any, are you getting any particular intelligence? What, in terms of businesses? Or businesses, yeah. Um, no, I, most of my surgeries uh, and, and most of the contact I get tends to be from individuals who are yeah. uh, contacting me about specific issues. I haven't had a huge amount from businesses, but I'm always very happy to hear from local Well, businesses. we know that and we know you've been extremely helpful to a couple of our members. So thank you very much uh, yeah. from them. And yeah. certainly uh, where, I, where we will let you know if there are businesses we feel you can help. Um, we, we take we, what we do is advise them to go down a certain from our knowledge of how to to reverse uh, any 
problem. Um, but if they hit a brick wall, we'll certainly come to you and see if, if, if it can help, because I know it will. I mean, it certainly helped a couple of our, our members. So thank yeah. you very much. So always happy to actually there was I was just thinking about it I had a surgery with somebody this morning about a totally separate issue but he's also a local business owner and said I've been struggling with you know one of my grants I'll be coming to you so you know that's the sort of thing that I have yes, been yes. Um, helping with and obviously you know people yeah. from certain sectors clearly part of campaigns to try and secure more support from that's so important and they do need to do it is quite um, a formidable thing. It appears simple to get your grant. In the first instance, it, it was simple. They simply, in many cases, the money fell into their bank accounts. Yeah. But as we go forward, there's an awful lot more, um, uh, well, there's an, an awful lot more of a form to complete. Yeah. And I think that's quite daunting for some people. I think it's got incredibly complex because there've been so many different grants at different times with the different Absolutely. levels of restrictions. And especially in the autumn when we were chopping and changing between tiers, um, yeah. you know, almost, uh, you know, on a weekly basis. Complex, at times. yes. For two weeks we were in tier two and then for two weeks we were in tier three and suddenly we we're in tier yeah. four. And for each of those periods, you're eligible for different things. So there's a huge yeah. amount of complexity there. Yeah. But thank you so much for your time, Amelia. Yeah. I'm ever so grateful as our, our business community. So thank you very much indeed. Lovely to chat. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, Anne. Thank you. Bye. Bye.